Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes, yes. So, you know, total acre replacements have come a long way, and, and we, we are now in the 21st century where we have access to electric cars that uh, look like Falcons and can go hundreds of miles between charges. Uh, you're able to wear smart glasses that allow you to do things on voice command. Uh, we have smart contact lenses that can man uh, to monitor your glucose levels. We have smart spoons that for the Parkinson's patient can help stabilize their tremors. And you have smart t-shirts that can monitor your vital signs. Um, and then the smart watch. So we've come a long way uh, into the 21st century with technology really advancing the things we can do. So why not have total ankle replacements that can allow athletes and individuals be more uh, mobile, to be more active into their, into their later ages, even after they've had ankle arthritis due to traumas or due to rheumatoid arthritis. Let's give these individuals an opportunity to have motion. So why total ankle? Well, severe painful post-traumatic ankle arthritis is extremely painful. And in fact, there's data to suggest that end-stage ankle arthritis is as severe, if not more severe, than end-stage hip disease. Um, we need solutions for these patients because these patients suffer from debilitating pain. They can have large bone loss. They can have other joint, uh, adjacent joint disease. They can have bilateral involvement. And we're looking for solutions that provide them with pain relief and preserve motion and stability. And so you have patients that look like this who have end-stage ankle arthritis, or like this, who have post-traumatic ankle arthritis, or even like this, who have uh, varus ankle deformities or valgus ankle deformities, and they are looking for opportunities to maintain uh, their quality of life through preserving joint motion. So the indications for ankle replacement are really uh, in, the, in the optimal patient, when you first start out doing ankle replacements, that optimal patient has less excessive demands and they tend to be the rheumatoid patients, the older patients, the post-traumatic patients, who again, tend to be over the 60 year old mark or those patients who have multiple joint disease. However, as you get more comfortable with ankle arthritis and total ankle replacement, you will expand those indications. And now at our institution, including in my practice, I've done teenagers who have ankle arthritis because we are comfortable with the revisions that may need to happen in their life. So the relative indication are the youthful active individuals and the contraindications traditionally are Taylor avascular necrosis, Charcot joint disease, neurologically compromised foot, or patients who have chronic infections. Now, end-stage ankle arthritis can be very complex, right? You have patients who can have the straight ankle that are properly aligned and those patients who have malalignment. And in fact, uh, about 37% of patients only have normal alignment with ankle arthritis. The rest will have some type of deformity that you need to be able to correct. So you have to be able to and be comfortable to do adjacent joint or adjacent or, or, or concomitant uh, ankle, foot and ankle procedures to help balance that ankle when you do the uh, total ankle replacement. You've got to appreciate the deformities both on the AP view with various that sagittal view where you can see sagittal malalignment where the talus can be subluxed anterior or posteriorly. So how do we do these ankle replacements? Well, here's a 360 degree camera of the setup in my operating room. And it's it's got a lot of individuals in there, not only the surgical team, but we also have the, rep, the, the team from the companies or the reps as we call them to help support the case. And then uh, you've got the sterile uh, back table, which has all of the sets open for whatever we're thinking about doing. And when we look at ankle replacements, we've come a long way uh, and it's evolved. When we first started doing these, you had these, these uh, uh, half ankle replacements that had a poly on the other side, which had tibial component loosening over time. And as it loosened, the, the tails could rattle and end up with a, uh, a malleolar fracture. And in the latest, uh, in the last generation, so before the latest generation, you have, and you, you still have globally but you had implant companies who had these total ankle replacements that respected the anatomy more, but still took a quite, a, quite a lot of bone away from the, from the joint. And when that happened, it would, you, you would struggle with revision type surgeries. So the common issues we saw in the previous generation, right before this latest generation, were tibial trays causing fibular impingement because these were not anatomic implants. 
you have the a limited ability to restore sagittal alignment, that tailor talus that's anterior and posteriorly subluxed. You really couldn't do much with it except for releases. It took too much bone away. So these were not bone devices. And so you worried about injury to the tailor blood supply. We had difficulty with tailor loosening on the tailor side. And you had this cumbersome instrumentation that, uh, that made it difficult to put the ankle replacement exactly where you wanted it, which is important for uh, ankle replacements to get the alignment that you need. So impingement, why is this important? Well, because you have a right ankle and you have a left ankle that have incisoras that house the fibula. And so you need to have an implant right and left that allows you to recreate the anatomy to house the fibula. Because if you put a rectangular device into the tibial uh, tray, you will impinge that fibula. And so the latest models are more anatomic, they're fixed bearing, minimal bone resection, they keep the instrumentation simple, but allow the surgeon to be able to place the implant exactly where they want them. And we believe that these are reproducible outcomes for, uh, in the long term for patients. This is the cadence ankle replacement uh, and allows you to have 670 different combinations of tailor component, poly component, and um, and t a tibial component to allow you to give the patient a custom implant without really having a custom implant. And it allows you to also have biased polys, which this was the first implant on the market to allow you to do that. It also had a tibial tray base plate that it had that incisura, so it was more anatomic and, and respected the fibular anatomy. Um, it also had some other features uh, which allowed you to upsize or downsize the implant without having to worry about new peg holes that you're making or, or new um, um, holes in the, in the tibia or in the talus that made you fixed to one size. And that's important because if you're in the operating room and you think it, this patient is a size two and you start putting the trials in and you realize, wait a minute, it's a size one or it's size three, you should have that flexibility to be able to upsize or downsize the total angle as needed. And so again, the tibial base plate has this incisura and so this is what this implant looks like on x-ray. Again, like I was saying, the poly, this is the first system that had a poly that was biased, either anteriorly or posteriorly, to help fix that sagittal alignment, which some papers suggest can be up, upwards of 30 to 60% of total ankle replacements can have this sagittal malalignment. And so to have a poly to be able to push the tails back or pull it forward, whatever the case may be, is important. So you want to get that alignment, the center of the talus, you want to get it back underneath the tibia where it belongs. And so here's a case where we're able as a poly to pull that uh, talus back into the center of the tibia. And then you have to do some, uh, some concomitant uh, procedures to help get the alignment that you want. Here's another implant. This is the Vantage Exact Tech implant. Again, it's anatomic, fixed bearing, minimal bone resection. It has axial pegs that go into the tibia with the presumption being that this also will allow for better fixation into the, into the, uh, into the tibia. Uh, it allows also for acceptance of the, of the incisura by, by just having a mild uh, curvature to the tibial, plate, uh, tibial tray. So again, uh, it allows for a more anatomic fixation. Um, again, it has these vertical cages that are fixed into the tibia. Um, so those are the two newest implants that are on the market, uh, starting to percolate globally. But when you look at the, in the U.S., the total ankle market, it is full of total ankle replacements that are currently on the market with new ones that are coming out later this year and even next year. So it is a very crowded space for a small volume of cases. The outcomes for total ankle replacements we know is very good. Patients have, uh, are better with an ankle replacement than ankle fusion patients when walking up the stairs, walking downstairs, walking uphill. And that makes sense because you have ankle motion. Total ankle patients have higher rates of satisfaction and better biomechanics of gait than ankle arthritis patients uh, that, are, that are fixed with fusions. The bilateral gait mechanics are much better with, uh, with ankle replacement patients. It's closer to normal with ankle replacement patients than with ankle fusion patients. Uh, the, the, uh, the pain relief is the same, equal, ankle fusion versus ankle replacement. But again, total ankle replacement patients at two years have better gait, better mechanics, better pain relief. So for me, ankle arthroplasty in the young is no longer a relative indication. 
I think the benefits of range of motion, pain relief, activity level when younger is much more critical than waiting, than fusing them when they're younger. And then when they're older, trying to take that take down that fusion and give them an ankle replacement. To me, that doesn't make sense. And that used to be the prevalent school of thought that you fuse them when they're early, you take it down when they're older. And, and when you fuse them, you no longer move the muscles that are in and around the, the ankle. And so as they get atrophy to 10 or 15 years later, then try to take down the ankle replacement and try to give patients motion again, really never made sense to me. So here's one of my patients who in her early 20s uh, got an ankle replacement. She is now in her mid 30s and the left ankle is where she had the ankle replacement. And you can see it still allows her to be fashionable where the shoes she, she likes. And she also is able to run, although against my medical advice. So, I, you know, I told you avascular necrosis is a relative contraindication. And only recently has it become a relative contraindication. You know, you have a patient who has uh, ankle AVM like this. And in the past, they were either uh, told that they can only get non-surgical treatment with some type of ankle brace or that they can get a TTC fusion which was fraught with non-unions, anywhere from 30 to 60% non-union rate of one of these joints, uh, either the ankle or subtalar joint for, for uh, um, uh, TTC fusion in the setting of AVN. So the challenge of AVN is, is that it's, it's hard to treat. 75% of the time, AVN is due to trauma. 90% of Taylor neck fractures go on to develop uh, AVN. And this has actually become, at least in the US, a little bit more of interest in the last few days because Tiger Woods um, unfortunately had a serious injury to his lower extremity. One of those injuries was a Taylor, uh, Taylor fracture. We don't know if it was Taylor neck or body, but the point is it has elevated this discussion in the U.S. temporarily in uh, AVN. 25% of atraumatic patients, 25% uh, of AVN patients are atraumatic, and that can be due to sickle cell disease, exposure to corticosteroids at some point in their life. Uh, patients who've had a failed ankle replacement who developed AVN of the talus, and, and then led to uh, an ankle replacement uh, uh, failure. And then you have your idiopathic cases where we don't really know why they're developing EVN. So the indication for a total talus is patients who have Taylor EVN, talus non-unions, Taylor collapse after ankle replacement, patients who've had subchondroplasties done. This is a product that is in the market um, where uh, we used to believe that if you had Taylor edema, you could actually stabilize that Taylor edema um, with calcium phosphate. What our group has noticed and has now published is that oftentimes these patients end up with Taylor AVN because that calcium phosphate has choked off the blood vessels in the talus and now led to Taylor AVN. The relative indication for total talus is that youthful active individual, but I'll share with you some cases that we've done in up to 14 year olds. And then the contraindications are the same as total ankle replacement, the sharp patients, the neurologically compromised foot, or patients who have chronic infections. And so here's a 19-year-old girl who had a CML as a young teenager. She was exposed to prednisone as a young teenager. Five years later, she has AVN and continued pain bilaterally. And you can see on this uh, MRI, both uh, up on the upper left as well as the lower right, that she has significant AVN, not only her tails, but distal tibia, and even someone in her calcaneus. And so uh, the father lives in another state, finds us on social media and, and realizes what we're doing, reaches out to me and says, hey, you know, is there any motion sparing option you can provide my daughter? So here's a total tail list that we are planning um, on CAD drawings. And how we do this is same thing as an ankle replacement. We go in through the standard anterior approach. We take a wedge out of the tailored neck. And so that separates the body from the head. It also disrupts the interosseous ligaments, so now that the body and, and, and it allows the body and the tailor head to be loose and mobile. One we then go ahead and take the tailor head and then the body right to the left. And when the first time you do this, it is amazing. Look at the anatomy of the posterior facet on the calcaneus, uh, which is a, a view that most of us have never seen before. And then we have these trials. So using a CT scan, the company uh, can can out the exact replica of this patient's anatomy, either using their affected limb if the anatomy is intact or using the contralateral side if the anatomy is not intact and then obviously doing a mirror image to, uh, to, to provide the, the talus. 
And so you have these trials of the, of the normal size talus, and then uh, we also have 10% decrease and 10% increase in size. And so we get a tray with these trials and then the, and the total talus, which used to be silver, which was cobalt chromium. And now we have an option of these gold ones that are titanium nitride, which we believe uh, uh, wears better against the cartilage. And when you put these taluses in and you have the right size, it's almost like a bipolar hip where you hear, hear the thud, you'll hear thud into the joint. And that's when you know you have the right size. And if you look at this motion, I mean, this is an unparalleled motion, whether it's for, for ankle, uh, total ankle, you just don't see this type of motion. Um, and, and it's pretty remarkable what these patients can get back. And so, you know, we, we initially started doing this on patients who had restricted ADN in, uh, in the talus without associated adjacent joint arthritis. But then we started getting more sophisticated and I started getting a little more bold, taking on those patients at ABN who also had ankle arthritis. And so here's a patient who came in to see me from uh, uh, Hawaii, and he has bad ankle arthritis, a sublux to uh, a talus, and also a vascular necrosis. But we can now take a total talus, take care of their ABN, put in an ankle replacement. So this talus is, is, is matched to the total ankle and allow us to replace his ankle, give him a new talus, he maintains motion, gets pain relief, and, and actually has an active life. This is a patient who is now three months out from her total talus and uh, against my advice, started doing box jumps. So this is jumps where you, you're on the floor, you jump up on a box, you jump down on the, on the floor, you jump back up even higher, you jump back down. So she's doing impact activities, which we don't want these total ankle or total talus patients to do three months out from surgery because she's feeling so great. It's pretty amazing to see these patients function. Um, here's a patient who has AVN with ankle arthritis and subtalar arthritis, and we can now do total taluses with an ankle replacement with subtalar fusions. And so we're getting more and more sophisticated as to what we can address. Here's a patient with AVN, subtalar uh, arthritis, ankle arthritis, but also a varus deformity and a fixed varus deformity. And she came in to see me and said, Dr. Parekh, either you amputate me or you do something to salvage my motion. And so we did a stage procedure where we put on an external fixator. I cleaned out the talus, actually put uh, a spacer in. Her talus looked a little questionable. It turned out she had a subclinical infection. So we cleared that. And then we did this total talus ankle fusion, uh, sorry, ankle replacement with a subtalar fusion. Now her alignment's much better on the sagittal view, but you can see that her talus is a little bit plantar flexed into the calcaneus, but she has a limb, she's walking, she's able to be active, something that she could not do with her varus, AVN, ankle arthritis. Here's a patient who had a triple arthrodesis done by me. Uh, he then developed ankle arthritis, so we ended up doing a total ankle replacement. And then I usually like to see my ankle arthroplasty patients every year. Well, this patient got lost to follow up, which usually means they're doing so well and it's inconvenient for them to come see you. He lives uh, uh, about three hours away from me by flight. And then he, he shows up seven years after his surgery. And you know that when you haven't seen a patient for a while and then they show back up, it's usually a bad thing. So he comes in to see me and if you can look at that talus, you can see the talus has collapsed. He has developed Taylor avascular necrosis under this ankle replacement. And so we can use 3D printing to create a brand new total uh, talus, which has an undersurface that allows for a fusion to still occur. So we can maintain the correction we got on the triple arthrodesis. And he has now salvaged his, uh, his motion. He's back to playing 18 holes of golf three to four times a week. And he's happy and uh, I haven't seen him again. So it's usually a good sign, like I said. This is a patient, uh, a sad story. This is a girl um, and this is not Tiger Woods. Uh, car. This is a girl who um, lost control of her car, hit a, uh, a wall, and uh, ended up getting extricated from the car. Uh, they lived about six hours away from Durham, where I'm located. And uh, the girl is 19 years old, was taken to the emergency room, had bilateral injuries on the left side. She has an open talus that is uh, extruded. The talus was extruded. On the right side, she has a pilon fracture. So the trauma team in this hospital puts her in the X-fix on the right side, talks to the mom about primary uh, amputation. The mom begs them not to do it. 
the next day returns to the scene of the accident, finds the talus bone, and brings it back to the surgeon, who now says, listen, there's nothing I can do with this talus because it's been extruded for too long. So she comes in to see me, has a cement spacer in, and uh, mom, so mom is told it's an amputation that this girl needs. The mom gets on the line, finds us on social media, what we're doing at our institution, brings the daughter to us. And, uh, and, and not only, if you look carefully, not only is she missing some of her talus, she's also missing the medial malleolus. So, um, and, and she's got an open injury. So uh, we end up clearing the infection first. And while we're cleaning the infection, we maintain the external fixator, but we also start designing a new medial malleolus for her, as well as a total talus. And so um, this is the medial malleolus that we are creating and it has a stem and as well as a plate. The plate will allow us to put in uh, screws that go from the plate into the stem. This is her total talus. And so she now has a 3D printed medial malleolus as well as a total talus. She's now 21 years old, has a limb. She's able to date, she can get dressed up. Things that are important for a 21 year old uh, to live life in a meaningful way. She's now able to do rather than having an amputation and prosthesis. Here's a patient who came in to see me from about eight hours away from, from our institution, has this bad uh, um, injury um, <clears throat> that's treated locally by her surgeons. So he gets this plate, gets the pinning of, it, of his talus, ends up with this modeling of the talus a few months after his injury, comes in to see me. He's got an elevated ESR DRP. His white count uh, is, is not elevated at all. This is a uh, three-phase bone skin showing uh, a hot area in his, in his ankle, so he's infected. So we have to go in and clean out this infection with a cement spacer. He grows out propriano bacterium. We clear the infection, but if you look here, he now has some subtalar disease, ankle disease, as well as talar navicular disease. And so we can, with 3D printing, I think I've showed you that we can do some really amazing things. And so he's, he was my first uh, total talus with a subtalar fusion and a talar navicular fusion with our ankle replacement. So we do a lot of biologics around the ingrowth surface of the talus. We've got this uh, fixation. This is what it looks like in the operating room. This is what it looks like under fluoros. And uh, we have been able to get him back to work. He's about a year and a half out from the surgery, has one to two out of, uh, uh, out of 10 pain and has done well. So we always hear, uh, you know, we're an academic institution, we're interested in looking at the data and we always hear, you know, how these patients really do. So our first paper, we wanted to look at patients who've been about 12 months uh, with their total talus, but we wanted to look at if we really restore their anatomy. So this is our first 14 patients. Um, and a lot of these tailor, uh, tailor again, patients collapse, so they lose their height. And so um, we know that now through this paper, we know that we can restore their height. This is statistically significant. And we can also restore their tailor tilt. So as they get collapsed, you can imagine the bond, the tails can start uh, getting malaligned. <clears throat> and we can restore that uh, uh, through, the, uh, through the total tailors. And that makes sense. And this is statistically significant restoration of their anatomy. So from this data, we know that tilts can restore anatomy. Um, and they can allow us to have viable options uh, for patients who have to uh, Taylor AVN. But what about their function? So this is the first 15 patients of ours that passed the 12 month mark, uh, patients who have Taylor AVN. Um, and, and we look at their preoperative uh, foot and ankle orthopedic scores versus their postoperative. And you can see here in the green bars, every single green bar is further beyond the blue bar, which means that pain, the symptom, the sports and recreation activities, the activities of daily living, and the quality of life metrics have all improved uh, that are statistically significant. And now we've, we've started looking at our two-year data. All right, so these are patients who are now past the two-year mark. Uh, the average is 22.2 months. And uh, the mean age of these patients is 43 years old, 43 years old at ABN. Their ankle range of motion is uh, uh, post-op is this, uh, similar to their pre-op, but I'll tell you that I, I think that this is probably not accurate because when I see them, they have better motion. We've done it uh, in controlling uh, procedures to help get them some of that motion. More importantly, their visual analog pain scores has been, have improved, and this is statistically significant. So if they're living on average at a seven beforehand, after surgery, they're at a three, 
most are up, I'll tell you, about one or two, but the average is about a three. Their FAOS, FAOS scores continue to be improved from pain, symptoms, quality of life, their activities of daily living. So we know now, and we will continue to track this, that total uh, TALOS patients who are using the total TALOS to treat ADN and adjacent joint disease have significant improvement in all metrics that we've looked at, have better anatomy. We are going to continue to follow this, this uh, patient population. Um, we are now over about 100 of these patients in our database, more than any other place in the world for 3D printed total taluses. But again, this is the tip of the iceberg. We're offering options where patients didn't have options before, and we're giving them hope. With marrying this type of technology of 3D printing with total ankles, we have something that's reliable. Total ankles alone have excellent survivorship. They have pain relief. This is a versatile solution for this patient population. But again, the future here is going to be 3D printing, really giving these patients uh, um, very anatomic solutions for their disease states. Thanks.